Well, hello, and welcome to another edition of Becoming a Gibberim. If you haven't stayed with us this far, it would behoove you to go back to part one and check out what this is really all about. Because Becoming a Gibberim is probably not going to be the textbook case study for textual understanding and definitions of all the things regarding gibberims. What it is going to be is just my walk through an understanding of what it takes to become mighty. What are some of the examples that we have in our life or the lives around us or from the sword of awesomeness? Where is it that we can learn and study and develop a way of becoming mighty? To be someone who is sincerely valiant, someone who is outrageously courageous for something they believe with such conviction that they become an unmovable object. Sincerely, we're talking about people that become fortresses, not just a little bit. Like these are the people that dig deep, so deep, in fact, that their convictions, their, de- their devotions to what it is they've come to know are so unmovable that they become something to behold, something to be remembered, something worthy of a legacy. Like what I'm not getting at is the names. What I'm not getting at is the particular individuals because just from scripture alone, David, right? We're going to talk about main mighty man, David, obviously, because he's just crushing life with stones and wool linen garments. Check out headshots if you haven't caught that one. That, that guy, good gracious, super mighty. But David also had a lot of homies that rolled up on him one day that were not so lovely. If you didn't know it, David's mighty men were generally like the worst case scenario fellas. As in, these were the screw ups, the has been, the whatnots, the past over, leftover debtors. Those, it was people that were basically on the run because they'd screwed up their life so horrifically, it was game over time for them. So let's go live in caves with some dude out there who's also a criminal, but we think he's a stinking awesome human and totally devoted to what he believes in. David had developed a reputation as a mighty man. There's lots of people who live and move and breathe today, lots of them, who are mighty people. Their stories just don't get told to you because the world is controlled by a bunch of serpents, sincerely. The dragon, if you didn't know it. There's a dragon, that's who we contend with. So we'll talk dragon scale and armor talk and what all this matters. This is the book I wrote. If you didn't know it, I wrote a book. It's called Snatched from the Flames. It's about getting snatched out of the dragon's mouth and the fiery nonsense that he breathes on all of us because we're all under the influence of this monstrosity of a system and systems of men that rule over us. But there's a spiritual war that that we deal with. But there's also a very physical war that we've all lived, which is called life, which is called suffering and persecution. And there's people out there who sincerely live in persecution more than you even can kind of start to get your head around. If you physically can see your leaps and bounds above some of these people who are mighty. I, I've i been talking my way through a little bit about some of the stories from this book. This book is on is by a gentleman named Nick Ripkin. Nick Ripkin. And that's not his real name because sometimes being a mighty person ne- means you live anonymously just for the sake of saving all the people's lives around you that you've impacted in such a way that they don't end up being executed and murdered and hunted like wolves in the night. Because there's a lot of humans who woke up today being actively hunted, hunted, pursued. Someone has made their life mission to end that person. Why, Why is it that I choose to talk about these things is because I know what it is to be hunted, but to be the hunter as well. And there is a whole other way of living and operating in the world that most people, especially people who would identify themselves as believers in God, people that love Jesus, people that have committed their lives to him, people generally don't think of them as the most incredible, bold, courageous, fierce sharp and cunning individuals. They tend to not be looked at like that. We tend to be considered like the soft target of the world. 
which is embarrassingly misconstrued. And that's by design, first of all. That's that old uh, dragon being like, ah, my mouth is bigger than everybody else's. He has more influence. Let's just put it that way. We don't revile the enemy ever when contending with the dragon. We don't. That being said, we respect and we appeal to a higher authority because the most high God is who we believe in. And we take a stand to have courage and belief and convictions for. We've rooted ourselves in the convictions of the one who laid the foundations of the earth. And when you do that, you become that unmovable object. You become a mighty man, a mighty woman. You become someone that's changed out of who you are and you begin to be transformed into who he is. And you sincerely become someone to be reckoned with. And it generally doesn't look like some of the stories we're going to read about. It doesn't quite look like that today. Because back then, there was a whole lot more sword and spear talk. Obviously, I think I would have loved that time frame more than I'm comfortable admitting publicly. It would have probably been spectacular to be alive during that days. Aren't there times that you read about in history where you're like, man, if I was only there, I could have just, I, that's, that would have been the era. Some of you I talk to are definitely all about like the 1800s. You're just, you have this iconic view of Western America and you're like that land of free cattle and barbed wire fence inventions changing the world and the gun but still it was the time of swords i mean there's epic times that don't you want to just go back into and wonder how you would do the bible to me is a giant history book that you can go and do that all the time in and there's some people who are smart enough to actually read the bible with such convictions that they believed it was true not just a little bit like they bet everything they ever had in their life on the belief on faith that it was true you could be trusted you could bet your life on it not only your life you could bet the life of your children and your family and your friends and everything that's ever mattered in your world on it the people in that book the insanity of god it's a lot of testimonials about people who live in this thing called the underground church it may be a new concept to some of you but there's huge swaths of the world where believers in this scripture are genuinely the most persecuted people in existence. And I would argue it's still the true in the United States. The persecution and the style is just a lot smoother. They're a, they're a lot more precise in it. It's like a nice psychological operation to move people out of powerful, mighty working in the kingdom of God. We've just been seduced into a very comfortable, convenient slumber over here. It's a very good way to appease your enemy is to just give them most everything they need and them not have lack or struggle or persecution. Because if you learn about the underground persecuted church, they don't operate with the same mindset that we do because they can't or they die. I mean that sincerely. I'm trying to equip people that are going through this series with me how to survive and not just die. Because if you ever happen to come into a place or a land or an experience where what you believe is branded, marketed, and sold to the masses as the most dangerous thing in existence, someone who believes X, Y, or Z, and they start to brand people with that as the, the reason for all of the calamities around us. Because that's been tagged on believers a lot. And that there's all kinds of hooks and lures that the enemy has used over time to ensnare people's minds, to capture people's minds so that he can control their hearts and then their souls. And that's a real thing. It's a process. It's, it is it is moving the, the minds of men. That is done very strategically. I gave a talk um, at a conference in 2019 called Standing for the Truth. Go watch that. I talk about the architect of social engineering, a man by the name of Edward Bernays. He wrote a book called Propaganda. And not all, not all warfare, not all tactics is necessarily propaganda is one major tool of it, but there's another one of psychological warfare. And that's, that is very powerfully used in the American mindset and population to move us and to control us and to sway us. Back in the days, they used to just have to use like flyers and leaflets and radio. Once radio came along, they could control influence of more people 
And then it broadly cast itself into things like television and now to where we voluntarily put things in our pockets and have perpetual streams of information fed into us on a regular basis. We voluntarily drink this stuff in very seriously. And because of that, we can get drunk on the wine of all kinds of naughty gods out there. Let's just put it that way. Bad streams. But we're talking about people who have set themselves apart. People that have made themselves different. They have become a peculiar people. They become someone that is an outsider to the rest of the group. They really are sincerely looked at as that. When you actually read this and do what it says and live like this, it's strange. We're this this I'm telling you I believe this book is true. I'm telling you I actually believe that that every word of this is true, not a little bit. Like I've bet every aspect of my entire livelihood, family, faith, future, everything I have in my life, I've bet on this being true. And it's cost me nearly every single thing that wasn't still substantially made of him. Everything that wasn't in line with that pretty much got ravaged and ruined and torn off or destroyed out of my life. And that was merciful. That was what I needed. That was what I needed to get dropped out of the world of normal, everyday, nine to five jobs, easy Christian faith, no real miracles ever being seen, reading about stories like this in the Bible, going to church maybe on Sundays, and really believing and hoping that some of these things would happen in my life or the lives of the people around me, feeling like I was being drip fed faith, like that I wasn't ever really getting to the stream of it, that I wasn't getting to the source of it, but I think I just had gone too long in my life being under the influence of people just sharing their thoughts on the scripture and way not enough of me just reading it and doing it. I I love hearing these testimonies of the underground church because these are people that they didn't necessarily get drip fed faith over their, their lifetime. A lot of them came to hear about faith and the scriptures and all these things in an environment where they knew they absolutely knew if they chose to join that kingdom, if they chose to leave what they had known as normal, if they chose to be bold about what they then believed, if they chose those things, it was going to cost them severely. They were willing to still make that choice knowing those things, knowing that like in China, he spends a good deal of time in here talking about the persecution of the church under the communist regimes in the 60s, 70s, 80s. He, he kind of looks into that generation of faith into the early 90s was when he kind of did this case study going around to all these churches and interviewing all these folks, but not actually going to a church, you understand? The church was the house, right, for basically ever. There's been places people gathered for celebrations like the feast days. Everyone would gather together at different events and go at a set, set apart location and gather and celebrate together and study and, and challenge each other and learn and fellowship and feast. That was a time of great congregation, but they generally couldn't go to a big church building every week because they'd be executed there or they would all just go to prison there or everyone who went would have their name database and logged into a list like an actual list that once you're on the naughty list with maybe the governing officials they made your life a nightmare they made your life really difficult maybe they just changed the way they taxed you maybe they just changed the way they looked after mm, your financial well-beings or status on benefits or scholarships or jobs they do all kinds of things to socially stifle believers in other places not here, but in other places, they stifle people that have these kinds of convictions that read this book and then start acting it out. Like they read, they read the book of Acts and then they go, wow, I think that's still possible today. And maybe we should be praying for people and fasting for people and interceding for people and giving our homes away to anybody who has need. If you don't have a house, I have a house and I have four bedrooms that nobody sleeps in. Maybe I should take some homeless people off the streets personally, not just theoretically. When I get moved by an emotional commercial and I donate money, I donate some mammon dollars.
to something and then I feel appeased in my spirit. What if you got some skin in the stinking game and you began to sweat and cry and bleed for what you believed in? Because these churches actually don't exist unless people are willing to go be murdered mentally, emotionally, tortured, ongoing, perpetual anguish, like actual brainwashing. Read, read about the persecution in the Soviet Union and what they did to literally brainwash children, people, sleep deprivation, water torture, physical abuse, psychological abuse. They tested this stuff out. It didn't just stop with the Nazis and their concentration camps and the mind control games that they learned. Their scientists have been working this dark magic science forever and mostly on believers. That just doesn't get publicized as well. It doesn't. There's other groups that have a bigger notoriety for persecution they've endured. But believers, because the dragon rules much of the world, their testimonies, the persecutions they've endured, the long sufferings, the genealogies of faith, those people that were literally sawed in two, like you read about in Hebrews, the, the hall of faith, like they like to call it, it's nothing like what people have been told. It's not the pretty Bible stories that you read to children out of their well-approved, good-marketed children's Bible version. It's not like that at all. It's barbaric. It's the worst possible thing. You've probably never even imagined evil so bad as what the body of believers suffer on a regular, perpetual, ongoing basis while you slept good tonight. That's a real imminent reality. For some of you, that's actually going to become your kingdom. That's that. If you want to be mighty, that's what you get. Because some of you are destined to that. If you want to serve him, he's going to call some of you to that kind of a future. Not, it, not a long ways off. Pretty much immediately. If you make that decision today in Somalia, you might have 48 to 72 hours. Maybe. Because their assassin teams are so spot on. Let me just... Let me just read you what real hunter-killer teams look like. If you don't know what SKTs are or special kill teams, they are teams of individuals who are trained generally by a religious military organization. And I say that because they're almost always mingled. They can act like they're not, even in our U.S. military. They're always mingled. There's God and country. What the capital G, God, is, or the lowercase g, God and country is, is always amiable and pliable in most most militaries. So in Somalia, in Somalia, this is how they handle the church. This is how they hunt people. And let me tell you this, what I'm about to read to some of you is outrageously hard to get your head around thinking like this, but I'm kind of not here necessarily for people like that. I'm also here for the guys and the gals out there who, when I read this, go, that's brilliant. That's game. Do you know what I'm saying? You'll know what I mean. Okay. So Nick, we'll call him, has was basically a Kentucky pastor, small town Kentucky pastor. He didn't really want to do that. He read the Bible at 17, basically for the first time and read it and went, wow, I think the Great Commission still matters. You know, where the final instructions from our commander were go therefore into all the nations and preach the good news to every creature. That one. He's like, okay, I guess I should do that now. And people, mostly believers, other Christians were like, why would you want to do that? Just go to church and then gather together with other people in this building. It'll be great. It'll be terrific. We'll see some impacts in small, tiny doses that will keep us barely alive for the next 55 years till we retire. And then we'll be miserable and crotchety and bitter. And then we'll die and go to heaven where we'll be happy. That's basically the, the Christian version that most of us were sold. That's garbage compared to what this book says it really looks like. Swords, spears, prison, miracles, just walking through walls. I mean, floating ax heads, donkeys that talk, dragons, satyrs. Hybrid giants, Nephilim, fallen angels, huge, massive, cataclysmic earthquakes, plagues, pestilence, disease, horses with individual entities on them named death because death is an entity indeed. Hades, 
also an entity, a place and a location, but also probably an entity. Yeah, stars coming out of the heavens, coming down to earth, talking with people, lighting the earth on fire with bitter wormwood. And I think the blood of the earth, every drop that's ever going to spill, is going to surge to the surface. Stuff like that. That's the Bible we read. I know it's not normally talked about like that, but guess what? The Bible's way more incredible than anything you've ever read. So I'm going to tell you about SKTs. These are special kill teams. These are put together by people that are super devoted, outrageously devoted to what they believe in. And they're not bad. I'm going to say that because there's a difference. Well, there may not be, they may be evil, but they may not be bad. And there's a little bit of a difference. It's important. Specificity of language is really important when it comes to killing and killing groups. Really, these people kill over very precise language. Like, you believe this portion of this book. I don't believe this portion of this book. Let's kill each other for that. Okay, that's important. So people that have the convictions like this said team here in Somalia, they got those convictions because of the world they were raised in, first and foremost. They were definitely not raised in Kentucky like Nick was. They didn't grow up in small back country where Christianity was something that was a product that was purchasable on every street corner. That was not available to them. What was available to them was the mosque, was, was the Islamic faith, was people that had sincere, incredible love for their family still, their, their kingdom, their, their area of influence that they had. There's different doctrines and sects within Islam, and it's really important to, to, to study it. If you haven't, you, it would behoove you to study things like that you don't know. Turn off the TV and just go read books. It's amazing. It'll change your life. Or even listen to other people read you their books. But really read the book because it takes discipline. And you need to build your discipline because it's soft and soggy like most of us. But these people grew up in a world where Christianity was never a product offered ever, really at all, except maybe supernaturally revealed to them. Or they just so happened to hear of one guy who... They'd been praying to Allah or to other gods, mind you. These people just are doing whatever they've been raised to do. And sometimes we would look at it and say, they're totally doing witchcraft. They're doing divination. They're into deep, dark wickedness and bondage. And they're into some bad stuff. Yeah, so were all of us. Get in line. True story. Read the book. It's, it's pretty horrific what I went through and lived through. But he can redeem anything. So those people are raised in a world where they may have gone to somebody like he talks about a guy who basically went to get uh, a ritual sacrifice done for him of a chicken. And the priest there told him, go fast and pray for three days. So he did. But during that time, Jesus came to him in a dream and a vision and told him very specific instructions, like in the book of Acts specific, where it's like a street name, go over a mountain. You're going to go down there. You're going to see two guys, go ask them a question. They're going to tell you something else. And they're going to tell you, go to this street. And when you get to that street, look for this house number. When you knock on the door, tell them that Jesus has sent you. This is a guy who'd never heard the name Jesus. Not a little bit. Like, had never heard the name Jesus. Didn't know what that meant. Didn't even know what Jesus is. Just a theory. It was a headless body that kind of came to him. This guy walked out of town. By town, I mean the tiniest little, like, dot of a village in the middle of nowhere, border town, in the middle of Africa. And then hucked his way over mountains into the town on the other side and just walked in blind faith and saw two guys exactly like he thought standing there. Talked to them. They gave him address where to go specifically. And he got there, found his way to it. Never been to a city before. He'd never even seen this stuff. Like never even seen it. And instead he ends up at the door of the one believer in the entire country. Well, it turns out there was three. One of three in the entire area that knew Jesus. And so he gets discipled by this old guy for th two weeks. Didn't tell his family, by the way, when he left. Didn't tell his wife, his children, because remember, you talk about it, you die kind of environments. That's called a non-permissive environment. That's an openly hostile one. Bad news bears for a lot of you. But good news for you happy hunters and you mighty men and women. So he goes over there, gets get, becomes a believer and ends up walking with the same kind of like genuine belief when he reads stories in the Bible and just goes and lives like that. Anyways, he tells st stories like this just all day long in this book. They're amazing. You need to read stuff like that. It's all in the Bible, I know, but it's dated to most of you and that's wrong. But just read some newer testimonies, people that are like today alive and could tell you their testimony. Fascinating. These special kill teams have gone out and actively persecuted and hunted anytime they found out believers were 
anywhere. They were so devoted to what they believed that they utterly drive out who they believe to be people devoted to destruction. And they walk that out with such intensity that they have entire teams of individuals placed generally within normal operating city, town, infrastructure situations, meaning they work normal jobs and live normal lives. But then at the night or at different times, if they get a phone call, they just go hunt humans, sincerely hunt them like a dog hunts a bird, really hunt them. So this is what Nick is introduced to in Somalia when he goes over to become a missionary, right? He instead is dropped into a world where there's special kill teams who have infiltrated every aspect of the society with a networked information, what would be like your human intelligence network. These are your guys, your rat lines for information. That's people who maybe catch word of something or see something that happens. And when they see something, they say something. So they spread that around as kind of like a campaign to if you see something, say something. And they just get everybody around them in their mind to start thinking that. And to uh, if you see something, you say something kind of mentality. That's this, I've, I may know of some places even in our country where they, they do that. Huh. You wouldn't think that they would ever turn that kind of a system on us. Interesting. I digress. But in this country, people are using that to call friends and say, hey, I just heard somebody say they had a Bible. And that's a big no-no in most of these places. Just the book, ink and paper, the book, because it's not just a book. They know it's a weapon, like a super weapon beyond unimaginable power. That book becomes the most dangerous tool in the hands of someone who actually reads it. Better yet, reads it regularly, memorizes it. That's so powerful. They understand these things. They understand that there's an actual enemy to them that is dangerous. Not a little bit. Like the most dangerous guy in the stinking room when he shows up. They know that one of these believers, when they come into their country, are the most dangerous individuals who've entered their land. They view believers, and not just believers, believers that have serious convictions, mighty men. They know what they're dealing with. They know that believers who become men of faith and women of faith in an environment that's already that level persecution, they know those people are seriously dangerous. And so you know what they do? They kill them as soon as humanly possible, like right quickly. And they do it in a way that sends an incredibly resounding message. So that's how they weaponize death. They use the death strategically to advance their cause. People would call this terroristic tactics. That's a nice fancy word for an ongoing campaign against something that will never be defeated. Brilliant marketing to sell us on a war that lasts forever. Really unsustainable because you have this fluid term that can be applied to any kind of a group. And that's difficult and spongy. And when you get that kind of spongy foundations, you get creeps in there. Lots of creeping, nasty, filthy vines who use that to choke out all the good that was originally there. And so instead, these people use the death of believers that they find out are believers in such a way as to weaponize fear. Fear is one of the most powerful tools to prevent people of cowardice from coming and doing likewise. Fear is a disease. It's an actual biologically rooted disease. I really seriously think you need to look into it. If you didn't think that stress and fear and stuff were actual diseases, they are. They, they've ended more lives than most anything ever. They're pretty lethal, especially if you take them in high doses. If you take them in low doses over long periods of time, it's like Advil. It will definitely poison your body and ruin your soul, really. So there's inoculants to that. It's called convictions. Special kill teams in Somalia super ripe with convictions. Definitely a little wrong when it comes to applications of said convictions. We can talk semantics later. But this is what Nick, who's been dropped into this world, is going through. He's learning how to interact in an environment that is so hostile to believers. He just doesn't want to get the one or two believers that might even pop up over years of their ministry, like years laboring maybe one or two believers. Beek, 
pop to the surface. Bink. And by that, I mean they somehow find a way by the Holy Spirit almost exclusively connecting them to each other, not phone calls or text messages and all those other intercepted means of communication. Like you could just pray and the Holy Spirit can reveal to you, there's another believer 60 miles away. Go to his house. He will have food and supplies for you. Stuff like that. And then you get there and you're like, hello. And they're like, oh yeah, I've got food and supplies waiting for you in this wagon because the Holy Spirit woke me this morning and told me you would be coming. Here's everything you need. That's the stories that you just get in oodles when you walk in kingdom. But these Somalian Christians that grew up over there and or he doesn't really say, he keeps it somewhat vague to try to protect the rest of their family from being slaughtered. You see, that's that's considerate. So Nick is over there trying to do good ministry work, realizing that he's just trying to basically hemorrhage a massive gaping wound from the civil war conflicts that broke out in the late 80s, I believe in the early 90s. Massive upheavals in this nation took place. And because of that, there is a cataclysmic amount of pestilence, disease, death, hunger, starvation, pirates, literal pirate gangs. The, it's just totally way worse than anything you imagine. He says like one of his tools in his kit that he has to carry with him every day is like linen burial cloths, just linen sheets, because he's in a Muslim country and they, they cover their dead with, with linen. And that's a way that he can honor them and respect them because he's not over here to just recruit Christians. Do you understand? He's just over here to be obedient to the gospel because sometimes you preach to every creature and even if it's a dead one because they're family. Anyways, he's just over there being faithful. He meets at one point with four believers. They share communion together. They, they, they share a small feast together in a bombed out, ruined place. They go through some incredible security protocols to try to make sure they can get there without anyone being tracked because so much of what they have to learn is tradecraft, like how to check for a tail. Like how do you determine whether or not you're being followed, physically followed by human assets? How do you determine whether or not you have electronic tracking on you? They go through all these steps because you have to do that if you're trying to be diligent to safeguard yourself from discovery of connecting with other believers. So they go through all these steps and they, they, they spend a, a moment together and it's one of the most beautiful times, okay? It's a huge encouragement for him. It turn, turns out, uh, I gotta go back one page here. But basically, uh, Basically, here's what happens. I'll just sum it up for you and then I'll read what the guy from the SKT wrote. Basically, what happens is Nick goes back. He's a Westerner, right? He's the Westerner believer. He's over there operating predominantly with almost exclusively with Muslim individuals who are in that region. There are no Christians for him to go like work with, but he's working with the Muslims there and he's honoring them as good Muslims that they are because he doesn't want them to be killed for giving any type of assistance to the enemy, right? Being a collaborator. Yes, you can be killed just for being associated with Christians in a lot of countries. So he doesn't even want them to be killed. But because what happens is he comes to find out that soon after that meeting where they all broke apart, all four of the guys or gals that met together and had that time together and tried to encourage each other, every single one of those other individuals, not Nick, but all four of them were executed within one minute one minute of each other and their bodies were straight up disappeared. That's some precision, okay? It takes an enormous amount of precision and intelligence and a communication and planning and then execution in order to do. A, and by the way, these are all very different locations, not even remotely next to each other kind of situations. This isn't, you just cleaned up a car. This is, you did this, openly, covertly for some, but immediately within a one minute window. That's That takes a lot of work to do. They were that devoted to do that. That took a lot of time to set up, meaning they probably had been onto these people ahead of time because it, it takes some time to set up an operation like that generally. Because of that, they get eradicated and Nick is just, 
And most of Nick's support staff over there are terrified. They are mortified because they also understand that what this means is that there is an active assassination team going around eliminating these people. And just to feed that fear, they publish a hit list. And that's really effective, generally. Assassination lists, like a deck of cards for assassinating people, that's a pretty powerful motivator for a lot of people in your human intelligence network to start going after targeted individuals, right? That's a really effective strategy. But when he, they publish it in the newspapers, they publish it all over the place. And they basically say, all of these people we suspect to be collaborators and or people working for or actually becoming Christians. And there's a lot of people on this list who have nothing to do with it, have zero skin in the game when it comes to wanting to be a believer. They just want to be a Muslim who wants to be able to feed his family. So he's working for an aid organization, stuff like that. There's a lot of staff that end up terror run away from Nick and because of this, and he understands. But later on, in order to try to clear some of these staff of his, their names up from being executed or on this execution list, Nick agrees to go meet with the, the terrorists with the kill team's leader, okay? He goes to agree with to meet with him in their compound, unarmed, without his normal guards. Just, like, actually think about it for a moment. You're a dude from Kentucky who's now in Somalia. You have a wife and children that aren't in Somalia, but that are definitely going to be fatherless if you die thing. Like... You're just a dude still. You got to remember, anytime I read about stories or tell testimonies of other people, they're just people. Like, they're, they're people, humans, like you have always been, most likely, even if you're not all the way. I love you, every part of you. Every aspect of us is still basically normal. But what is totally different is the supernaturally powerful unction of a living God who moves and lives and breathes and walks himself out through your life because he sends you, if he sends you somewhere, you're immortal unless he changes that actually. And people in the underground movements, they know that. They know that and they operate with that. It's like I said, it's conviction. It's knowing. It's having the unction to obey and listen to your your master, the Holy Spirit and the Father when he tells you to do something, you go and do it with such commitment and knowing that you were supposed to be there. Even if Nick got executed here, he had the knowing of going. He knew he was sent, okay? And if you're one sent by the king of kings, if you're one who's actually sent out, like if, if I was commanded by a general personally to go do an individual mission and he gave me credentialed papers to go, right? An order, like a standing order, when you get ordered to do something and you go not just as in your name, but in the name of the one who sent you, all kinds of stuff happens. Like your doors are open in places they would never be open. Like opportunities present themselves and confidence is upon you. Like you have just a totally different unction in your gumption. You know what I mean? You operate very differently because you are going in the name. You re represent all the same authority they have. So Nick is going in the name of his living God to meet with the den of thieves, right? I don't mean that to be a demeaning in any capacity. I just mean if you're an assassin, if you're a murderer, you're a thief. You are the thief of thieves. Welcome to the den. So practical living. If you take a life, you're a thief. Absolutely. So you need to just not repent for murder, like, but thieving. Anyways. He meets with this terrorist group, and this is basically the conversations. First of all, he vouches for his men that are working for him on his support staff. He gives them their good Muslims. He gives them a good witness in front of the other Muslims who are, will execute them and their families if they don't. He clears up the matter for them. Those men are so thankful, right? He said, they're, he said basically... Um, the militants actually thanked me for clearing up the matter and promised to scratch the names of my employees off of their list. I was stunned by their reasonable response. 
When I turned to leave, I stopped, looked back, and inquired, Can you tell me why you publish a list of 150 names when you know that there aren't that many Christian believers in the entire country of Somaliland today? I realized immediately how stupid that comment was. I should have just kept my mouth shut. But they went ahead and answered my question anyway. You're right, they admitted. We believe that there are probably no more than 40 or 50 Somali Christian traders left in our country. But we also know that if we list the Christians that we already know about and add to the list those that we are suspicious about, then we have a good chance of getting everyone. It was a cold and calculated strategy. And it was a strategy that was confirmed by a chilling exchange that I read in a local newspaper a day or two later. A militant Islamist had written a letter to the editor asking, why bother killing Somali Christians? Wouldn't it be more effective strategy strategy to just kill the Westerners that they associate with or who might convert them? The editor responded this way, killing Westerners, he wrote, might turn them into martyrs. So it is not cost effective to kill Western Christians whose deaths might possibly inspire additional committed believers to come to our country and take up each mantle's, each martyr's mantle. If, however, we kill off their converts, the editor predicted, the Western Christians will be afraid and they will go home. The editor's conclusion was chilling. These Western Christians will not be able to watch their converts be killed. When their converts are killed, the Western Christians will leave. As much as I wanted to object, I knew that there was truth in the editor's words. At the time of those four assassinations, there were approximately 70 committed Western workers serving with relief groups in and around Somaliland. 60 days later, there were four of us still working with Somalis. To this day, I do not know why I didn't walk away too. I did remember thinking that leaving at this point would mean that the sacrifices that my friends had made for Jesus in Somaliland would be wasted. I thought of my four friends and I thought that somehow my staying would honor their memory and give value to their deaths. That's a mighty man. You want, you want to read about David? Read about David. Read about mighty men that are right now alive. There's mighty men and women all around you. You just don't look at them like that yet. You don't see them as they are because they've been buried by all this worldly garbage for so long that they are a just quaking Wake, soon to be waking body that is stirring now with so much restless energy because they've been idle and stifled for so long that it is going to soon rise up in a way that it's never risen before. And I actually mean that. They finally turned off the entertainment nonsense of sports and, entertain, and, and the mainstream entertainment that's been stifling men and women for decades, for generations. Don't be ensnared by it again because there's stories like this waiting to be read, yes, but lived now. You, you could be living a life of that kind of devotion and, and unction today. You don't have to wait. That's immediately available to all of you. Do you see how calculating the enemy is? Not just not just the editor who wrote in that post. Do you see how brilliant a strategy that is? That's cunning. That's crafty. That's subtle. That's serpentine doctrine right there. That's very, very smart for very, very evil things. Yes, you have to give respect to where it's due because some of you who, when I read that same story from the editor, went, that stinking brilliant game. That's good strategy in warfare, right? Remember, if you just replace the phrase 
Christian there and put terrorists there and we were the big good heroes going to hunt the terrorists, we would totally agree with that strategy. But what I'm talking about is if you are the one who is going to be hunted like that, will you still go? Will you still be the one who's willing to go and be executed or be the survivor? Because I know about being the survivor and it's a nightmare too, all its own, because there's a gift in martyr's death that some of us have been waiting for our whole lives, right? Some of us have been waiting for our anguish, our long suffering to be over because there's a lot of people who've been living testimonies like that since the day they were born. And they're exhausted and they're weary and they've been storing up suffering in their bodies for decades of their life and they're waiting for their master to release them and they can't wait for that day. But then there's some of you who've never once tasted suffering. And so all these people out there in the body are storing it up for you. They're storing it up so you can be at peace. Because there is a balance, that it, a homeostasis that needs to be brought to the body of believers. And there's a huge area where cancer is growing. And the cancer is called cowardice. And it's infected us. And it's fear. And it's panic. And it's doubt. And it's insecurity. And it's envy. And it's jealousy. And it's pr it is the doctrines of disbelief. That this can't set you free and make you as mighty as any of these men and women that we read about and hear about. You have all that same waiting for you. Those people, the strategists, who are putting together a way of killing off the believers, were killing off not just the believers that had popped up. They killed off the support for the Western Christian believers movement that they'd been doing in four deaths. That's pennies potentially free if the blades are generally free after the fact but potentially for a few pennies they planned off and eradicated the entire support system of the christian relief organizations that have been operating in their country with four deaths and good propaganda pr pieces press releases to capitalize on it that's a psychological warfare operation that was planned and strategized and very effectively carried out. They do the same thing constantly all over the world. And that's not the evil. The evil is the men and women who have that same kind of game, that same kind of planning and craftiness, that same kind of level of intelligence and forethought. You battle strategies. Like there's, there's people that do game theory. These are a lot of the people that run the world that don't really get talked about as much. There, there's this whole human intelligence network behind what gets identified as the big bag boogeymans and the conspiracy groups point fingers at and the religious groups or this, the governing groups. But there's just a lot of super smart think tank groups that really do architect and create systems of control and moving people. Okay, They do it for good but for bad for but for gray all the time. These people have a great way of doing that. And they could take that same gifting and talent and ability and become believers in the living God and apply that same mindset towards advancing this kingdom. Every one of us can become converted. That's what those that's what the the special kill teams there, they feared the most. If you notice, they feared a few of those things most sincerely. The first one was just dealing with their converts. But they also had enough intelligence set up that they believed they knew where all the converts were at any given moment. So they weren't super concerned about that. But there was something they were genuinely concerned about. And that was the mantle of a martyr. There's a serious mantle that happens when someone gets these kinds of mighty convictions in their life. Because what it does is it starts to inspire people. It's infectious, just like fear, boldness. Boldness and courage were the two main fruits of the Holy Spirit. If you ever actually read the Bible, you'll learn it's boldness and courage that makes us set apart, that makes us strange, that makes us the immovable object in the lives of doubt. It drives people mad who don't understand it because you don't move 
when you've got boldness in your heart and you have conviction in your mind and you have faith in your soul. You are so different and it is suddenly the worst thing you've ever seen in your life and you hate it like nothing ever or it's the most attractive thing you've seen in months or years because you're starved for it, because you've been fed counterfeit versions of it, like a guy who catches a pigskin when other people are trying to tackle him is not courageous. That's not courage. Walking into a den with terrorists who executed four of the believers that you've been loving and laboring with for decade, that's, or for years, that's courage. That's conviction. Turning off the television and spending time with your family or your friends or a coworker or someone on the street, that's courageous in our society. That's bold. That's strange. Getting yourself out of the entertainment trap will make you strange in this world. Just turn off the black mirror and look at your human beings in the face. Get to know them. Get to know your neighbors. Actually get to know your neighbors. Do you even know their names like this much? You've all lived in your compartmentalized, fragmented little worlds and cultures and micro economies and systems. You've been trapped in a maze. Like your literal neighborhoods are designed like a maze for for, for where do you go get food? The, the rat goes over here, gets food. Like just think about it if you were an architect and you wanted to plan a rat race. They just, you just plan it. They're city planners. Ugh. I get distracted. Go look out into geomancy and how they established and built all our cities. They built us to be in a giant spiritual maze, physical and spiritual. It's ridiculous. We'll get to that someday. But people have been trapped in that. And when they suddenly see someone who's got outrageous, courageous going all over them, I was suddenly curious. I'm innately curious. And it draws people onto them. David, David, same thing. David was outrageously courageous intro onto David scene. We all talk about it. Giant human tank, hybrid, crazy tank. David, David shows up in a linen, sorry, in wool because he's a shepherd and a boss of sheep, folks. David rolls up on a battlefield, goes and finds a rock, a good hard one, probably somewhat smoothish, and then kills the super tank with his own sword because that's even more bossa nova remember that story that's david entrance onto most people scene that's pretty courageous most people are like that's memorable i definitely remember that dude doing that i'm suddenly definitely curious about what that guy's wanting to do with his life because he's got some unction in his gumption and i'm really really wanting to be around it because that might just be infectious people want to be around courageous people they do. They want men and women of conviction more than they want just somebody else that'll say the same stream of influence that they've heard 500 times. Did you see that show last night? Oh, yeah. How's weather? Great. It's like the wholeness of the American life conversation instead of, hey, do you feel like your soul's getting ripped out with fear right now and panic? Yeah. Should we talk about that? Do you know I know the one who conquered fear? He could give you hope that would just absolutely flow like a river from your soul and it would change your life do you know the good news even a little bit do you know anything about good news it doesn't come on the tv by the way good news comes out of the mouth of believers and the word i get distracted i apologize for my rants sometimes but they're necessary <sighs> i talked to you guys about david because he's also our mighty man of study right now david's about to make a serious mistake and i don't know I don't know if it's totally a mistake as much as it's the will of God about to happen in such a very brutal way that it's undeniably the most encouraging, monumentally important time of his life. And I would say it's also one of the hardest times of David's entire lives. They tend to go together. For Nick and all of those guys, monumentally encouraging time of his life. Unbelievably heart-quenching, crushing time of his life as well. That's a hard balance, middle ground. David was the favored one of the king and of everybody. People are dancing and literally, he's got, he's got lady armies dancing in the streets singing his praises for his courage and his boldness and his just phenomenal willingness to dance with reckless abandon before the Lord. Fantastic. High point in David's life. He's on the meteoric awesome track of 
slinging stones, slaying giants, probably fighting hybrid lion-faced men, meaning there were men who had faces of lions. They're real. They're called the lion men of Moab. One of them may have been a righteous one, so we can't say they're all evil. Remember, the gospel to every creature. Preach the gospel to a hybrid because he might just turn and become our kingdom's hybrid. I mean, you don't know. You're not the judge. So just preach the gospel if they desire repentance. Fantastic. I would like a lion-faced man to be my bodyguard one day. That would be terrific. It would be unsettling at times. But David's, David's doing all kinds of mighty acts out there. He's getting a name for himself. People are respecting David. People are laying their lives in his hand and trusting him. And David's fav David has favor of Yahweh. That's evident in his life. He's indefeatable. Okay. Well, David's about to be almost defeated because the king himself hates him. That's bad news. That's super bad news because the king is also almost always depicted with a spear. Really. Remember, carry a stick. It's called a staff. And then you put a spear on it. It's a spear. Every one of you should have spears and staffs. The king especially because they're distance tools. King Saul begins to get tempered by a spirit from the Lord or tested by a spirit from Yahweh. Wait a minute. I just said something that most of you probably didn't notice. Yahweh sends a spirit to torment Saul, basically. What? Does Yahweh do that? Most assuredly. Sometimes Yahweh sends the evil into your life against you. Most seriously. Sometimes he sends it against whole nations or countries or worlds because he is the creator. And you better believe it. He can command a demon to go somewhere. That ain't nothing to him. It's impossible for man, apart from the power of him living through you. But he, yeah, he sends demon, evil spirit. Let's say, uh, oh man, I'm sorry. This is a, it's a little harder to find. Not so clearly marked. I'm going to start to mark my passages. I need to do that. But, oh. Hmm, little dead airspace for you all just to breathe because I know I talk most of the time. Oh, here it is, conveniently enough. This is 1 Samuel, by the way, 19, 19, 9, 191. Okay, when there was war again, oh, I'm going back a verse. Now, when there was war again, David went out and fought with the Philistines and defeated them with great slaughter so that they fled before him. Now, there was an evil spirit from Yahweh on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing the harp with his hand. Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence so that he stuck the spear into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. What? Come on. That's a spirit, evil spirit, superpower. If you didn't watch my interview with the holy hand grenade, I talked about spirits giving you supernatural abilities. I don't know what kind of wall this was, but to stick a spear into the wall, you got to have some hoss in you, man. I've thrown spears. They're not easy to throw. Like, uh-uh. It's going to take a lot of practice to learn how to throw spears well. David, playing the harp, is playing the harp because Saul would get this evil spirit on him. There was a spirit that would come upon Saul that was evil, but it was said it was sent by Yahweh. That's really interesting, and that's one of those perplexing theological conversations we can have another time. But it's to advance his will, even against the chagrin of most of the folks around him. David, though, could appease that evil spirit. David could cause peace to come upon Saul when David would be in his presence. That's because David's a mighty man and the spirit of God rests on him. David, just by physically being there and then singing or worshiping and talking or being around, gave ease to that dis-ease in the hearts of the people around him. Saul wanted him near him. That's awesome. Then suddenly Saul says, I'm gonna throw this spear and stick that tiny little prune man to the wall. Somehow, supernaturally unction in David's gumption causes him to slip away speedily. That's smart. Evade. 
escape and evade. Like really fundamentals of getting out of there. He evades very quickly with due haste, right out of the presence of the spear coming out his face. It's a good, good move. Duck pretty prevalently barrel roll forward if you need to. Generally, most people never perceive the barrel roll forward coming at them. <laughs> most people just never shoot guns down. They almost always shoot up. Tuck that away. You might need it someday. And then you just come up. I'm going to tuck that away. David rolls out of the way. I'm assuming. It doesn't specifically say. It says he slunk. What was the word? Slipped. Slipped. And I assume slipping is a downward direction or angular. He's slinking out of the way. Either way, pretty clever. Spear sticks into the wall. Maybe it was made of wood. Still outrageously impressive to stick a spear in a wall. How many of you have tried it? Can you personally attest to the fact that you know how to stick a spear in a wall? Go throw a spear into a tree and see if you can get it to stick. Like, fixed into it. I think Saul literally was being superpowered by the evil spirit as well, because that's definitely also possible. So David gets away. David now becomes a man on the run. Really. And I think right there is where some of you need to be left. Really. Because this video is getting a bit hasty. I'm going to have to hasten up this video if I'm going to keep some of you around. I'm going to pause it here because we're going to get a little hasty pasty. We need to talk about that because it's time to talk about being on the run, actually on the run, not a little bit. Like you're running for your stinking life for real running. Like, can I pack my bags and be out the door with my whole family or just me in less than 30 minutes? How about a 60 minute window? If I just picked up the phone and said, oh my gosh, Issachar. I have a lot of friends named Issachar. It's a car. It's a red light. Red light, bro. You need to remember that time when we stopped at that red light and we ate Dairy Queen? Yep. It's definitely that time. I am so hungry right now. Let's go get some. And your bro, Issachar, goes, oh my gosh, that's a prearranged signal that we once had ahead of time. That way he didn't just say, hey, the guys are going to come and kill you right now because they're probably listening, right? Don't say that stuff. Set up code phrases ahead of time. Make friends and set up code languages because it's wonderful. David and Jonathan do that. It's biblical. So when you want to do Bible study next time and you want to meet illegally, well, not illegally, just against the advice of the people around you. If you want to meet in your house with more than five people, let's say, let's say 10 or 30, because you should all come around and maybe go over code talk. Hey, should we have some prearranged cues in case it no longer becomes permissive for us to have Bible study in our house? It would behoove you. Think about that. Read the Bible. It tells you how. David and Jonathan set up one such of these encounters, and that's where we're going to take this thing. We're going to take this thing right into runningville because it's time for some of you to go on the run. Sincerely. It's okay. You can now. It's going to be a wonderful time for it. You can learn all kinds of new adventures and skill sets out there. Go learn skills. If you're going to go out, learn this because it'll teach you all the skills you ever needed to know. All of them. All of them. Fundamentally so. All right. That being said, I hope you go and think about how to be safe out there. By that, I mean live as dangerously as possible every single day of your life because the days are sincerely evil. But you were born for such a time as this. I love you. I care about you sincerely. And I do hope that you will think about maybe fashioning a spear. Actually fashion a spear. I mean it. I would love to see that, first of all. Second of all, spears are sticks. Just go find a stick. You can do that no matter where you live. I'm almost certain basically anywhere sticks are still amiable. So... Get crafty with your sticks. Go find a good hardwood tree. And if you don't have one, well, go find a pipe and cover it with wood. I get, I get excited when I think about that. Anyways, I love you guys. Be well. I'll talk to you soon.